Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, I want to speak about the phenomenon that in the case of very high cycle fatigue, most uh, researchers are just using the number of cycles to fail them. And um, our uh, main topic is how to get physical-based information what's going on during a very high cycle fatigue test. My co-author, former PhD student from me, actually is working as European patent office in the Netherlands. And uh, the outline of my talk, I, first I want to explain in some details the testing facility which was used for these experiments in material and the specimen design cyclic deformation behavior in the very high cycle fatigue regime. And this point is not that easy because cyclic deformation means you have a relation between stresses and strains or other physical based data during a fatigue process. And uh, I just <coughs> want to show that this cyclic deformation behavior <coughs> is connected with microscopic changes in the material. And I also want to show that the frequency analysis in a very high cycle fatigue test, which is running at a frequency of 20 kilohertz, is a very sensitive tool too. Okay, and that's a rough overview about the testing facility we have developed at the University in Kaiserslautern. But the whole system was built by the members of the institute with a several uh, with several components which are available. Uh, one point, one uh, important point is the generator, which is coming, the ultrasonic generator, which is coming from a company. We have uh, measuring systems for very sensitive electricity measurements, and uh, all these components are commercial, but we have to put all the things together. A very central part of the test system is the oscillation system you can imagine and during such tests a frequency of 20 kilohertz it's necessary to cool the specimens and the whole test is running in a so-called pulse pause mode you have a certain time of cyclic loading with a very high frequency and you uh, are you are using a cool cooling system with dry air to keep the temperature of the specimen on an acceptable low level. Just to give you more understanding about the ultrasonic testing facility, we are using the piezoelectric effect in this converter to have a high frequency oscillation. The booster is necessary to end up with a defined uh, relation between the oscillation and the existing <coughs> stresses in the specimen and the main aim is that in the center of the specimen exactly here the stress is at its maximum value and the oscillation value is zero That's, oops. as I mentioned at the beginning, different uh, physical data. One point is the generator power, which is measured during the whole test. And I have to mention that the measuring system is, uh, in a certain way, high sophisticated. We are using a measuring frequency of 500 kilohertz, so that we are able, in a test with 20 kilohertz loading, the frequency to measure about 200 points uh, related uh, power and stresses or temperature and stresses and continuously measured data are the generator power, the temperature change and the mechanical oscillation with a laser Doppler interferometer which is coming from below at the end of the specimen. And this value, the specific electrical resistance is also very important. This value only could be measured in 
force of the test, so it's not possible to measure this continuously like the other one has. And the electrical, the specific electrical resistance, rho star, is a function which is related directly at the, to the microstructure of the material. It's a kind of a fingerprint of each metal and uh, it's depending from the dislocation density, <coughs> dislocation, arrangement, vacancies, pores, micro cracks, all such uh, microstructural details are influencing the uh, specific electrical resistance. And during such a very high cycle fatigue test, the changes in the microstructure are very limited, but with our system with a very sensitive uh, measurement of the resistance, we can identify these changes. And here's uh, one example uh, about the capability of the measurement system. Here we have such a pulse. Then there's um, a decreasing amplitude. That's one uh, ultrasonic impulse. And you can see we are able to measure the amplitude as a function of the time. So you have to look at this. Uh, scaling here is 10 to the minus 5 seconds. It's a very short process, and we are able to measure a detailed course of the signal. And if the specimen shows any failures, so this one is a, a large failure, it's already beginning fatigue crack, then the signal is disturbed, and we also can measure this in the course of uh, the amplitude versus time. And the application of these tests are related mainly focus to the German high-speed train, but the, the problem and the material which is used in Germany for the high-speed train is a medium uh, carbon steel with a carbon content of 0.5 carbon. The same system of wheels is used in France and Japan, everywhere where the high-speed trains are running this 300 and more kilometers. And uh, the microstructure is a kind of uh, theoretic, theoretic, magnetic condition, and we have taken our specimens from real wheels, so that's a wheel section directly from the company which is producing the wheels for the ICE train, and the specimen, uh, the bars for the specimens were taken out of the wheel with water cutting to avoid any uh, influence by the machining process. And one important point is here you see a sketch of such a wheel. The production process includes a so-called ring chain. It's a tricky thing to cool the specimen after the forging process to uh, end <coughs> up with a defined microstructure, which is very important uh, for the application of the leads. And here you see, uh, I think most of you will know this, time temperature transformation type diagram which gives you the relation between the cooling curve, the blue one and the, uh, the yellow one and the red one, which are related to different positions in the wheel because the forged wheel has a, a kind of heat production from the interior to the surface and that means near to the surface the cooling process is fastest and we end up in this case with a vigorous hardness of 318, a little bit more in this area too, it's just 278. And this dotted line is of great importance because all these wheels used around the world are used for a distance of about 2 million kilometers. After 2 million kilometers the wheels will be changed. And during the uh, running process, to the, during the time in service, the wheel is remachined to avoid vibrations. So we have a so-called polygonization effect in the wheels. Um, and uh, if you are <coughs> running with a train uh, and the wheels are not machined in the last two or three months, you have a certain vibration in the cars. And therefore, uh, a certain part of the material is taken away by remachining, and this line is the final minimum diameter. The diameter of such wheel, of all these wheels, is about 920 millimeters, and this line is in the range of 870. So that means um, from here to here, it's 
taken away by machining. And um, this, uh, this uh, area A1 is near to the surface, and here you can see ferrite, perlite microstructure, and if you go to the flange of the wheel, you see directly that the ferrite uh, component is much higher. And uh, so here again, these sections we have identified, and in the different sections of the real component, that's a very important point, you cannot do such tests with laboratory specimens. You need in the background a real component to have results which uh, allow to identify the critical time in use of uh, these high-speed trains. And so we have in the area in the area A2 here to the limitation diameter, we have a current fraction of about 11% and the semi-tight lamellar distance is 0.17 microns. And to identify critical loads during the ultrasonic fatigue test, we uh, use uh, ultrasonic fatigue tests in the load increase mode. That's also not that easy. You see the number of cycles with constant load was 10 to the 6. We started with a stress amplitude in the range of the endurance limit, that means very low. And then the amplitude was uh, raised about 5 uh, megapascal in each step after 10 to the uh, 6 cycles. And so that's such a stepwise curve. And during this test, we measured, for example, the change in the temperature at the surface of the specimen with a thermographic system. Uh, one point I have to mention, you cannot adapt any sensors at the specimens if you are running a test with a frequency of 20 kilohertz. Everything would uh, flow away and the, the resonance behavior of the specimen would be influenced if you attach uh, some strain gauges or whatever. So that the temperature measurement without contact is one solution. Then we uh, measured the maximum power of the generator because to keep uh, I think I have to, to hurry up a little bit. Um, so we have done such tests with electrical resistivity with two different uh, specimen types, with 7% ferrite and 11% ferrite. And you see, if we are measuring the resistance, it's very sensitive. The specimen with a higher amount of ferrite shows earlier plastic deformation. And that means the resistance increases at a lower number of cycles. And so this picture only should show that the measuring system is very sensitive. And we tried to correlate the measured data with uh, microscopic investigations. And here you see one example after four times 07, 10 to the 7 cycles. So that's really at the very high cycle fatigue range. We have the formation of intrusions, extrusions, and a small micro pack in the ferrite area of the wheel. And we have also done transmission electron microscopic investigations. And here you see a plot of four different tests. We uh, interrupted the tests after a certain increase of the resistance change. Uh, just to identify or to have a better chance to identify changes in the microstructure that means dislocation density and so on. And uh, so here we are really in the, so that's at the beginning, number of cycles zero, we have a perlitic structure with the normal dislocation structure and density. If we go to 10 to the 7, you see already a certain increase of dislocation density in the ferrite. If we go to 10 to the 8, we have also dislocation activities inside the paralytic area. And that means we have very high local stresses. And here, here you can see uh, dislocation walls between the cementite lamella. And I have also uh, compared this uh, transmission electron microscopic pictures with the diffraction patterns. And here you have a very clear indication that you are 
operating your test in the very high cycle fatigue range with the formation of small subgrades. Because here you have uh, no real uh, diffraction pattern but this uh, diffraction rings. And we have also done electro backscattering diffraction. And here you can see with increasing uh, number of cycles until 10 to the 9 cycles, we have a, a very defined, clearly defined uh, sub brain structure, which is one indication for a very high cycle fatigue uh, structures in such uh, steels. And let's get to the end of my talk. So this area B is the pulse time. And I can show you that the change of the frequency is also a very sensitive tool to identify that in the material which is developing. So here we have, again, the specimen is 11% ferrite, and here the specimen is 7% ferrite. And at the number of cycles, 0.64 times 10 to the 7, you see the frequency of the test is nearby to the 20, 20 kilohertz. And then we have a decrease in the frequency, if you look at this scale here, 150 uh, 150 hertz less as a function of the beginning fatigue process. That means plastic deformation in the material. And as a consequence of the plastic deformation, the friction in the material increases. And you need a, a higher power to keep, the, to keep the frequency on the high level, or the frequency is decreasing. And that's also the case here in this uh, example with the uh, 7% uh, ferrite material. I mainly wanted to show you that the physical quantities, generator power, specimen temperature, electrical resistance can be used, can be used to characterize the cyclic deformation behavior in the very high cycle fatigue regime. And uh, all these changes could be correlated with uh, information we got in the scanning electron microscope and in the transmission electron microscope. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Could you please go back to the slides where you have the increased stepwise loading? Um, we're also doing such tests, so what maybe surprised me a bit, uh, you increased the load after only one million cycles, and on your graph one could see that something is already happening in the middle. I mean, usually you increase the load when it's a run out at around 10 to the power of nine. Of course, you would save time like this, but don't you think you could overestimate the fatigue limit when something, the crack already uh, started to grow like on the lower stress amplitude and then you increase? Mm -hmm. so, uh, or is it some kind of a standard way? Uh, this test only was done to identify loading parameters, that means in this case stress amplitudes, which lead to a certain change in the microstructure. <coughs> so the, as, we, as you start a test with a very low amplitude like this one here, you, you have no idea which loading condition could be detrimental for the, for the material. And uh, therefore we made this load increase test, with, uh, and you mentioned this uh, uh, step with uh, with one million uh, with uh, one million cycles. <laughs> ten million cycles. Uh, yeah, it could be ten, ten million or one hundred million, and then you so can have crack. The only uh, aim of this test was to identify critical loading conditions, and the other tests I showed you with a scanning electron microscope and also with the transmission, they are tests at constant amplitudes. Mm -hmm. And this one was only necessary to identify really critical loading conditions at the point. Okay, so another task. Uh, and uh, the sequence you asked about the uh, 10 to the 6 cycles, it's depending from the material. If we are doing such tests with aluminum alloys or other uh, or, uh, austenitic steels, then we are using different uh, 
lengths of the Yeah, there are no fatigue limits, of course. And also the, the um, increase of the amplitude is also different. So this, it's not a standard process. It had to be adjusted at the different materials. OK, thank you. I would suggest uh, the, the other two questions to be asked during the break. Thank you. Thank you.